to attend the meeting virtually in Spanish, the option is available. Hannah Interpreting, would you please communicate that for us this evening? Thank you. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Esta reunión va a ser eh, interpretada simultáneamente entre el inglés y el, el español para los que asistan virtualmente. Si ustedes están en una computadora, en un momentito van a ver la opción del mundo terráqueo al pie de su pantalla. Van a elegir Language Interpretation, Interpretación de Idiomas, y luego Spanish o Español para que puedan acceder a la interpretación simultánea. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. If you wish to view closed captions of this meeting, please view the meeting on the SMU HD board meeting YouTube channel. The link to the YouTube channel can be found on our website. You may view the live stream meeting tonight. Gave you the captions. We can't hear you. That's one, two. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Okay, I'll just start over. Thank you. Okay. If you wish to view closed captions of this meeting, Please view the meeting on the SMUHSD board meeting YouTube channel. The link to the YouTube channel can be found on our website. You may view the captions in English as we live stream our meeting tonight. And you may view the captions in a variety of other languages if you choose to watch after this meeting has ended. Viewers may request additional accommodations by calling 650-558-2201. For our deaf and hard of hearing community, we have a team from HANA Interpreting Services, and they will be interpreting our meeting this evening. We would like to ask everyone to remember to speak at a clear and reasonable pace for our interpreters. Thank you. Okay, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, student Board Rep Lai, can you please uh, lead us with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, moving on to item I, adopt the agenda. The Board of Trustees may either adopt the agenda as presented or make a change to the agenda through a motion, second, and a majority vote. The Brown Act prohibits any additions to the agenda without a 72-hour public notice for regularly scheduled board meetings. Are there any questions or comments from the Board of Trustees or Superintendent with respect to the agenda? No, if there's no um, changes, I move to approve it as is. I wanted you. to pull, pull. I don't know if I do this now. I wanted to pull um, an item off consent. We'll go to, when we get to consent, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll ask right. you for that. Um, thank you. Um, well, first, um, are there any questions or comments from the public? There are none. Thank you. Okay, um, and we had a motion by Trustee Chavez. Um, can I have a second? I'll second. Great, motion by Trustee Chavez, second by Trustee Jacobson. Um, let's see, are, is there any discussion about the agenda? No? Okay, all right. Um, we will go on to roll call vote. Um, Trustee Griffin. Aye. Trustee Chavez. Aye. Trustee Jacobson. Aye. And I vote aye. Um, Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to public comments. If you are joining us in person and wish to make a comment about an agenda item or during the public comments section at the beginning of the agenda, please fill out a request to address the board form and submit it to the secretary. This form should be given to the secretary before the agenda item begins. If you are joining us virtually, use the raise hand feature on Zoom to be recognized. When invited to do so, your camera must be on before you are called upon to make a public comment. We will call on you to begin your comment once we have promoted you into the meeting. If your camera is not operational, please email your comments to the Board of Trustees at board, B-O-A-R-D, at S-M-U, 
hsd.org. Please note that comments are limited to three minutes. The board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comment, depending upon the topic and number of persons wishing to be heard. I will call on in-person comments first. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Aquino, is there, are there any? There are none. No? And how about on Zoom? There are none. Okay. All right. Moving on to governing board comments. Um, I will start with Trustee Griffin. Trustee Griffin, do you have any comments tonight? Just a quick one. Um, probably the highlight of my 28 years here. I, I finished my two years on the uh, CCS Board of Managers, and they gave me a lifetime pass. Aww. which may not be that long for me, but anyway. Oh, no. I, uh, I, I told him I would use it as often as I could, as long as I could. So I, I really enjoyed the time serving there. So, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. That's great. Congratulations. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Hey. Okay, Trustee Chavez. Congratulations, Trustee Griffin. I don't know what uh, Mr. Yancey has for me being on this COC committee, but a lifetime of visiting the school sites, maybe. Yeah, I would take it, I would take him up on it. I have a few things to share. Um, it's been an exciting last two weeks. I want to showcase a couple of our events that we had. Um, well, on Sunday, uh, March 17th, uh, I attended the Cappuccino WASC meeting. That's Western Accreditation, Accreditation, right? Western Accreditation for Schools and Colleges. Say that five times. Um, and um, that was great. And I saw Principal Gomez there. He's here in the audience. Yeah, but it, it was interesting because I, Mr. Brian Simmons and myself were interviewed by the WASC team for about 30 minutes. And prior to that, I was part of the tour of Cappuccino, which I already know, but I love being on the tour. It's great. So that was exciting. Um, and then on March 21st, with my friend sitting next to me to interpret, I attended the Latino parent organization meeting. And it's great because every flyer is in Spanish. And I actually stood up to make a, a comment. Um, so that was translated because I what I said was, uh, I'm hopefully I'm saying this properly. I said, no hablo espanol, lo siento. And they, the whole crowd laughed. But I do want to say that there were over 50 parents there. And I was so impressed. I think these meetings are at least once a month. I received the text messages from Cappuccino. At least 50 parents were there. I was really impressed. And Mr. Brian Simmons and Dulce Hatch, they were they presented for the second half of the meeting. Lots of parents participated. Um, we talked about mental health awareness. I have a couple of notes here. Signs of depression. Um, having a decreased increase in, in interest. How do how do notice when your teenagers are not interested in items that they're usually interested in activities? And also how to improve your communication with your teenager. Um, don't give lectures. Be patient. I know my teenagers ask for my credit card all the time or the last three digits. But I'd like to have more of a conversation than just that. So it was great participation by the parents. And I was really impressed. And I, I, I intend to go to the next one and have somebody next to me again to translate. Um, I was just really impressed to see over 50 parents at that. That was at Cappuccino. And I know um, Brian, uh, Mr. Brian Simmons and Dulce are going to go to the other school sites as well. I think they've already gone. The other uh, amazing event was, um, sorry, let me turn my page, was... On March, uh, I'm sorry, March 23rd, Saturday, I went to Oye, and I'm wearing my Oye shirt. Raise your voice, raise your community. So that was at Kenyatta College, and that was for all students in our entire county. And it was amazing. I saw a lot of students, tons of students. Um, I spoke with a few trustees that were there as well. And I went to a couple of breakout sessions, classes with the students. Um, I saw school buses bringing students, Boys and Girls Club buses, um, uh, one of the classes I stopped in on was Finding Your Strength um, with Adversary. Um, it was just an, an amazing event. I have the brochure if anybody's interested. Uh, what, what I thought was really amazing was everybody's wearing the, the nice, the really well-designed black shirts for Oye, but also they had tons of classes to pick from. So, you know, each class was about an hour and a half. It's just sessions to choose, you know, to choose from. They had a couple of before lunch and a couple after lunch. I just thought that was really well well put together, um, and it's really great. So it's it's an annual event. So if anybody's interested, I have a brochure here. Um, let's see. And then, let's see. Let me go back to my notes. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, I, I went to um, the Cappuccino High School Musical Chicago, and I thought the singing was phenomenal. I put some videos on Facebook, and it was just, I just can't believe. I'm in awe of how talented our students are. 
And then in the evening with Trusty Jacobson, you could speak more about this. We saw the Aragon play Murder on the Orient Express. And I guess I had never really seen that movie or that play before. But I do want to say that I asked Trusty Jacobson, I don't know how these students memorized two hours of lines because that play has to be at least two hours long, right? I'll let her speak more about it, but I was really impressed. And then lastly, I'll just briefly say that this past Monday, I attended the San Mateo County School Board Association um, quarterly meeting. And it was right here in this room. And we were uh, we were introduced to multi-tiered support system for literacy, a dyslexia experience. And we, depending upon what table you sat at, I received the table where it was a paper that would typically be how a dyslexic student uh, sees their um, uh, reading materials. And we couldn't read past the first sentence. Like literally we tried to read it. Other tables had, had the, the version without that. So we were asked to read a couple of sentences and then the table next to us would read a few sentences. And then when they read their few sentences, they didn't have any problems. So we felt like what's wrong with us, right? But it was to put ourselves in that situation and there's and also to highlight the fact that um, there's universal screening. So we discussed universal screenings for dyslexia um, and the fact that there's so many, that's such a high percentage of, of folks that have dyslexia that we weren't aware of that. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to say, oh, during the OEA experience, I wanted to mention that I visited a couple of booths that they had there. I brought some handouts here, the flyers. So there, so right now Caltrain has $1 youth rides um, Any in any zone, was from zone one to zone six. You have to have a clipper card, but the youth fare is a dollar. So I think that's pretty amazing. Another booth I went to was Peninsula Family Services. They offer a lot of services for families and 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 students. So just, I want to make everybody aware of that. And I know I've talked a lot, so thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Jacobson. Thank you. Yeah. So as Trustee Chavez mentioned, we attended the Aragon play and that was my first time attending an Aragon performance. So really fun and impressive, um, what the students put on. They had accents, French and Russian and English. They had a dialect coach. It was cool. Um, and then aside from that, I've just been attending a lot of lacrosse games. So it's fun to watch um, the lacrosse season um, across the district. And I just wanted to recognize all of those uh, families in the community who are observing Ramadan this month. If I hadn't been at this meeting, I would have gone to an iftar dinner that I was invited to. And those also who are celebrating Holy Week this week, um, I wanna acknowledge uh, the special time of year that this is for many different faiths in our community. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I've got some comments. I'm gonna start with the land acknowledgement. Um, this acknowledgement was created by the students at Cappuccino um, last year. And so um, I like to I like to present this one. Um, our community acknowledges that all of our campuses lie on the ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone. The Ramaytush are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula, whose land was stolen from them and whose native language was lost because of Spanish colonization. As settlers on the stolen land of the peninsula, we should be alongside the Ramaytush, remembering and honoring their ancestors and relatives. We thank the first people, the Ramaytush Ohlone, for taking care of the land we use now for education and activities. Our responsibility of caring for the earth is unique and personal to each of us, but should be rooted in allyship with the Ramaytush Ohlone so we can work together to protect and preserve the land for future generations. Um, I was able to attend the uh, Hillsdale High School refugee panel last night, um, there, or yesterday, excuse me, some of the students in one of the classes, um, they presented some plans on what to do in refugee crises. And they had three different panels. One was uh, talking about Syria, one was talking about Ukraine, and what was talk one was talking about Venezuela. And just their, like the way that they thought of all of the different plans and how they would work with different countries and um, just the way that they work together 
uh, it was really, really interesting. Um, I really liked how the teacher turns this more into like a, it's, it's very hu humanitarian and it, it just shows, um, why and how people have to leave their homes. So it's really, really interesting. Um, I attended the, um, the, the district English learners advisory committee last week and, or, and like, uh, trustee Chavez was saying, there's a ton of parents that attend. Um, but what's really neat about those groups is that they're, um, you know, they're families that we usually don't hear from. And so it's really nice to know all of the different issues that they have going on in their community and um, also how we can uh, work together to serve all of our students a lot better. Um, if people are interested in that committee, reach out to Elsa Pulido and Joanna Fate. Um, I attended the Equity Advisory Committee the week before that um, that uh, Dr. Kemke and um, uh, Dr. Simmons uh, lead. Um, and those are really interesting. So we're always looking for more families and more students to join us. So if you'd like to join us, that would be great. Please reach out. Um, I also attended the WASC at Hillsdale High School on the 10th. And um, I guess all of them are a little bit different in the way that we um, interact with the um, with the interviewers. And so um, what was neat about that one was that I was able to talk to a lot of the students um, and meet people that I hadn't met. There were people that um, were part of the DLEC committee. Um, and it was, it was really neat. Um, I also want to acknowledge those that are observing Ramadan and Holy, um, like Trustee Jacobson said, it is a time of um, a lot of observance of different religious practices. So that's that's good. Um, but most mostly, I, I also wanted to acknowledge a lot of the young people that are suffering all over the world right now, um, especially with education and um, you know destruction of universities and of history. It's really important that um, that we just think about that because these are generations of young people that are not going to have an education like a lot of people do. Um, okay, so I think I think that's all I have. Um, if people um, are experiencing some trauma through everything that's been happening in the world, um, as our students especially, we have wellness counselors and mental health counselors that can help. Um, so please, please reach out. Um, and so now, oh, yes, Trustee Land, you're here. I'm sorry. I think we're at board comments. Yeah. yeah. Are you you're, done? I'm almost done. Okay. Right in the nick of time. I, I was just holding a spot for you. So I was talking along for that. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. And thank you. Um, go ahead, Trustee, uh, Trustee Land. Well, I just want to apologize for being late. I was uh, doing my other actual real job, which was um, as BIS principal, I had to introduce myself to um, to Hoover School and just introduce them to the PTA. And just I introduced my vice principal, and then I left as soon as I could to get here. So I apologize for being late, and I, apart, I, I apologize for my tardiness. And that's it. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, um, so now we will go on to communications to the Board of Trustees. Um, Superintendent Booker, are there any communications? No, not tonight. Okay. Um, and going on to recognition, the exciting part of our, our board meeting tonight. Um, first, we will um, we will talk about the San Bruno Community Foundation grant. Thank you. So this evening, uh, Belinda Wong, uh, a member of the San Bruno Community Foundation Board, is here tonight presenting a $15,000 community grant check to our district for the Summer Bridge Program for rising ninth graders at Cappuccino High School. In September of 2023, the district applied for a grant with the San Bruno Community Foundation on behalf of Cappuccino High School for funding to expand its Summer Bridge Program for incoming ninth graders. The district was awarded $15,000 uh, from the foundation for the program, which helps students build uh, foundational academic skills needed to be successful in high school academically. And in recent years, the school has added a social emotional learning component to help students build bonds with one another 
as well as adults on campus. The program allows students to develop organizational skills to be successful in high school and make connections uh, to others before school begins. And so I just want to welcome Belinda Wong. We also have Jose Gomez here, who's the principal uh, at Cappuccino. So why don't they both come on up? But Belinda, I want to hand it off to you first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you may know, the San Bruno Community Foundation was created by the city council uh, to minister the restitution funds from the PG&E um, 2010 gas pipe pipeline explosion. And as part of that, the foundation created these grants to honor the memories and the lessons learned from that tragedy to support important work to improve the quality of life in our San Bruno community. So this year we are thrilled that, um, I'm excited to present the, the grant to the San, San Mateo Union High School District for the Cappuccino High School Summer Program out of the 300,000 funds that we are distributing, uh, which includes a $100,000 donation from the YouTube and Google.org for the sixth year in a row. Um, so we know that the transition from middle school to high school can be very challenging for students. And the Summer Bridge Program at Cappuccino High helps ease this transition while enhancing interpersonal connections and addressing social emotional needs. And it prepares the students for high school through academic support and team building activities. And we look forward to future opportunities to partner with Cappuccino and the district on efforts to benefit the students of San Bruno. Thank you very much. You. Uh, Principal Gomez. You can hold. <laughs> good, good evening, and I'll just make a brief comment. Um, I just want to thank again uh, the San Bruno Community Foundation on behalf of the Cap Cappuccino community, as well as the San Bruno community. I just want to acknowledge and uh, thank all your hard work to support our students and families. Um, and lastly, I also want to thank Laura Chalkley for supporting us in writing the grant. So again, I look forward to reporting out some of the progress and uh, highlights of the Summer Bridge Program. And thank you once again. Thanks. Oh, bravo, that's great. Thank you. Okay, and now we'll go on to Burlingame High School Varsity Boys Soccer Team. So I just want to <laughs> congratulate our uh, Burlingame yeah. High School Boys Varsity Soccer Team. Congratulations to to. Uh, to, to coach uh, Dimac and the and the Burlingham High School boys uh, for securing the Division Two NorCal Regional Championship on Mark, March second at Doherty Valley High School, the boys secured the victory in a two to one overtime thriller while earning soccer's uh, uh, first ever NorCal championship and only the second sta state championship in history of the school. The first went to the girls basketball team in 1988. Dylan Rosen's goal in the 88th minute gave the second seeded Panthers a golden goal win in overtime to beat top seeded Doherty Valley uh, to capture the CIF Northern California Division II championship. Prior to the game against Doherty Valley, the team won nine of 10 games and their overall record was 18, four and one. They were also the PAL Bay Division champions. Dylan Rosen was PAL BA, uh, Bay Division forward of the year. Alte Ordubadi was the Bay Division Midfielder of the Year, and Hank Lane was the Bay Division Defender of the Year. Uh, becoming NorCal champions is a great honor and an incredible achievement for the school and soccer and athletic departments. Uh, the game must have been awesome. I got to see some video of it. And as a uh, former soccer player, I played at St. Mary's College. I coached varsity soccer. I never made it to NorCal championships. So I'm super jealous and congratulations. Really, really fantastic job. Well and I'd love to invite uh, the coaches who are with us tonight to talk about the team and, and this achievement. Thank you so much and big congrats. Uh, congratulations. All right. Well, hello. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Anthony Demich. This is my assistant coach, John Becker. Uh, it just was it was a pleasure all year coaching uh, these guys, a tremendous group. I'm um, just proud to represent Burlingame High School and uh, the district as a whole. Um, just phenomenal season all year. Like I said, we won the league um, handedly, uh, eight wins, one loss and one tie. Uh, won the PL division, uh, went to CCS semifinals uh, in Division One. 
And then I obviously went to NorCal's and had a great run and won the first NorCal championship ever. So just real proud of these guys. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these boys embodied everything. I'm sure we'd all agree uh, that we want in high school students. Uh, they overcame adversity and odds uh, and fought all the way to the end uh, with just skill and working every single day uh, embodied by their uh, coach. Uh, I would agree, um, but ultimately these uh, boys represent our district incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, and congratulations. Yeah. For that. Fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, this side of the room was asking you to get a picture of the team. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Get introductions. Could they stand? Yeah. Up? Could they stand up at least? <laughs> yes. Let's see who up. they yeah. are. I, I I can see the guy in the front row. He's, I just want to play soccer. I want <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be up yeah, here. I just want to go. <laughs> yeah, we have about half the team tonight. A lot of kids are playing club soccer. Um, oh, yeah. So we got about half the team here tonight. So you would you want introductions? You want yeah. to stand up? Yeah. All right, yeah, let's see who they are. Guys. Yeah, should, they should be proud. Yeah. yeah. That's what we Bravo. Just congratulations, gentlemen. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, real proud of you guys. Are any of those oh, yeah, yeah. are any of those top players that you mentioned here tonight? Oof, now they're all playing at their high level okay. club soccer. Oh, okay. yeah. they, club soccer. Well, unfortunately, we had a uh, banquet last week and they missed the practice. So their coaches were not very happy to have them. So they're making them do this. Oh, yeah. Every player is yes. important. We're glad that you guys are. Yeah. Here. I think Miss Chocolate wants to take a photo. Yes, please. We'll get taken off. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. That Thank works you. for us. She's nice. got the spot. Just pick Thank up. you guys. Congratulations again. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to item three, National Arab American Heritage Month Proclamation. Thank you so much. So this is an action item for us tonight. We're joined this evening by uh, Abraham Alfakuri, who is a junior at Cappuccino High School and a member of the Student Board Council. Abraham helped to author this year's National Arab American Heritage Month Proclamation, which we present tonight for your approval. Abraham will be reading the proclamation uh, here this evening. Thank you so much for coming, Abraham. Uh, sorry, before I jump in, I'd just like to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, so now the San Mateo Union High School District Proclamation recognizing April 1st through the 30th of 2024 as National Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas April is National Arab American Heritage Month, officially established via a declaration by President Joe Biden in April 2021. It is a time to formally recognize the achievements of Arab Americans and celebrate the Arab American community's rich heritage and numerous contributions to society. And whereas Arab Americans are not a mere fragment of our society, however, a rep representation of the people's shared experiences in society, one with our collective humanity, one of diverse backgrounds and faiths, vibrant tradition, bold innovation, hard work, commitment to community, and remarkable devotion. And whereas an estimated 3.7 million Americans have Arab roots, according to the Arab American Institute, with ancestries traced to 22 countries in the Middle East and North Africa, including Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Palestine, Morocco, Iraq, Jordan, Yemen, Bahrain, Tunisia, Algeria, Sudan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and others. Whereas through the ubiquitous presence of Arab Americans, the roots are amongst the entirety of the United States. Their contributions to our society are unwavering and reach from the East to West Coast. And whereas California, to our advantage, is home to a wide cultural spectrum of diverse people, we know that our diversity is our greatest gift. Our state is for fortunate to have the largest Arab American population in the country 
with more than 715,000 Californians of Arab descent. And whereas the San Mateo Union High School District serves, recognizes, and appreciates numerous Arab American students and their families. The district cultivates shared communities with every student in mind, thus including Arab Americans. And whereas, in addition to achievements of Arab Americans in classrooms, businesses, and faith communities, the achievements of Arab Americans are reflected in Rashida Talib, the first Palestinian American woman and second Muslim woman to serve in Congress. Talib is a true representative to Arab American contribute contributions to our society. Whereas we see Arab American Heritage Month as an opportunity to lift up the profound and wide ranging contributions of this vibrant community in all facets to our society and remain committed to doing so outside of the confinement of Arab American Heritage Month. And whereas we also recognize that even as Arab Americans enrich our nations, many continue to face prejudice, bigotry, and violence. Arab Americans are exponentially larger than the stereotypes in which they may be unjustly associated with. And together, their advocacy in our district, instances of prejudice and violence will be combated and disrupted at the root of the cause. And whereas, we as a district are grateful for the rich experiences Arab Americans bring to our classrooms and workplace and for the exquisite contributions they make to our schools and community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the governing board of San Mateo Union High School District that April is designated as National Arab American Heritage Month and that San Mateo Union High School District calls upon schools, staff, students, and families to observe April as National American Arab American Heritage Month by celebrating and recognizing the past, present, and future contributions made by Arab Americans in our country and in our school community. San Mateo Union High School District passed and adopted on the 20th day of March 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the trustees. Does anybody have any comments? Trustee Griffin, do you have a comment? Uh, no comment. Um, I think it's good that we are recognizing their contribution. I said no comment, and I'm making a comment. <laughs> I, uh, okay. I beg your pardon. Uh, I think it's good that we are finally recognizing the contributions by so many sectors of uh, mm -hmm. of our society. So, yes, thank you. Um, Trustee Chavez, do you have anything? Just want to echo what uh, Trustee Griffin said, um, and also to add that the our young scholar there did excellent in reading out that proclamation. So thank you for doing that. Um, Trustee Jacobson, mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Land. I just want to echo the same thing. Thank you so much for such a great reading, and really appreciate it. You did honor to the whole proclamation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, this is the caliber of students that we have here, y'all. So. We have excellent students. Um, I, I also just want to mention, you know, proclamations are great, right? And they're recognizing people and um, they're a good statement, but action is what's really important. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, different organizations right now that are um, asking for volunteers um, to help out in uh, Gaza or um, other parts of of the world that are needing that right now. Um, and so there's um, one called the Palestinian Center, and they were actually also asking for people that could um, teach online remotely um, for people that are refugees to, uh, in the different uh, places where they can access their education. So if anyone's interested, um, it's called the Palestinian Center. Um, they're also taking donations and things like that um, for any sort of aid. Um, so if people are interested, please, please, please do that. Um, this is also a big reason why we are very inclusive when it comes to ethnic studies and U.S. history. Um, everyone, Arab history is American history. Um, Latin American history is American history, African American. So everybody is part of the tapestry of this country, and it's important that we recognize everyone. So thank you. 
Um, are there any questions or comments from the public? There are none. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the National Arab American Heritage Proclamation Month Proclamation. Thank you. So I have a motion by Trustee Land. Second. And second by Trustee Griffin. Um, I will take a roll call now. Trustee Griffin? Aye. Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. Trustee Land? Aye. And I also vote aye. So, oh, and our student board representatives? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we'll go on to the Autism Awareness Month proclamation. Thank you. Uh, tonight is uh, tonight. We bring to the board an Autism Awareness Month proclamation, and we have a special video with Evelyn Louie, a ninth grader from Aragon, reading the proclamation using an augmentative device, and Varun Hedge, a tenth grader at Burlingame, reading parts of the proclamation as well. Special thanks to Dr. Uh, Holly Wade. Director of Special Education, who helped to both author the proclamation and pr produce tonight's video. Yeah. We ask the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that one in 44 Americans in the U.S. are living with autism, a complex lifelong development disability that typically appears during early childhood and can impact a person's social skills, communication, relationships, self-regulation, <clears throat> and... Mm. Whereas, every April, Autism Awareness Month is celebrated, beginning with the United Nations sanctioned World Autism Awareness Day on April 2nd, to increase understanding and acceptance and to foster worldwide support for those living with autism and... Whereas, Autism Awareness Month serves as an opportunity to recognize and celebrate the unique gifts and talents of all individuals with autism spectrum, highlighting their valuable contributions to society, and... Whereas, Autism Awareness Month provides a platform to increase understanding and acceptance of autism and its unique challenges and strengths by pro providing support for individuals on the autism spectrum within our school community. And whereas the district aims to promote a culture of inclusivity where every student, regardless of their neurodiversity, feels valued, respected, and empowered to reach their full potential. And whereas the district's commitment extends to providing continuous professional learning opportunities for educators and staff members to deepen their understanding of autism and call it weight effective strategies for addressing the diverse needs of students with autism and Whereas the district aims to advocate for policies and practices that promote the rights, dignity, and well-being of individuals with autism, ensuring equal opportunities and access to meaningful participation in all aspects of life and... Whereas during Autism Awareness Month, the district will engage in various educational and activities and events to promote acceptance celebrate diversity and highlight the contributions of individuals with autism. By uniting in this effort, we aspire to create a more compassionate and inclusive environment where all students have the opportunity to thrive and succeed. And now therefore be it resolved that the San Mateo Union High School District Governing Board hereby proclaims April 2024 as Autism Awareness Month. This proclamation is made to reaffirm our steadfast commitment to fostering 
environments where students with autism can be flourish academically, socially, and emotionally. Cemetery Union High School District passed and adopted on 28th day of March 2024. Excellent. Okay, um, I'll turn it over to the trustees. Uh, does anybody have any comments? Um, Trustee Griffin. Well, you comments? know, I, I have to, I, I, I'm the first one, but that was really remarkable. And I, you know, I thought uh, we're recognizing all the elements, you know, all the members, the constituencies in our society and in our district. And that, uh, I think that was probably a first in this district. There are a lot of first uh, superintendents, so uh, you got to watch that. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, in a good way, yeah. <laughs> Not watch it the other way. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Chavez. Um, I'm just so proud of our students. This is really amazing. Um, we continue to see videos of of all showcasing all students, and I and I I have to say, this proclamation is spot on um, to promote acceptance. I I know we you know we know in past, you know decades even a, a decade ago or even two decades ago you know a lot of parents thought their autistic children wouldn't be accepted, so they kept them at home all day. And it's just not right. I'm sorry. But I just think proclamations like this, we need to just to trustee Andrade Zuniga's point, we need to do something with it. But this is part, this is a step in the right direction to promote acceptance, to to just the whole inclusivity. Did I say that right? I'm <laughs> just emotional, compassionate. Um, I just I just wish that we could get the word out to all those folks out, all the parents out there that are worried about bringing out their autistic children, no matter how young, no matter how old. They're worried that they won't be accepted, and we just need to love up, love, love up, love up upon everybody, you know. And I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, Thank you. And sorry. Uh, I just want to say, in elementary school, one of like my closest friends uh, had autism, and I feel like there was a lot of stigma about it. And like, I just I feel like kids they don't discriminate. I actually didn't know this until I was told, and I feel like even this all this like stigma uh comes from you know like just the older generation so we have to stop this at the source and there's still I still see like some really insensitive jokes in high school and I feel like that shows that there's still a lot of work being done but seeing a proclamation like this is just so inspiring and I just want to like I just feel like it's just so amazing thank you great comment thank you um trustee Jacobson I'll just add to what's been said. It was a wonderful proclamation, a good good um, thing to do to recognize everybody and support everyone in our district. Trustee Lant. I think a lot has been said, but what really, that was so moving for me in the sense that, wow, I was just so proud of what we're trying to accomplish, which is put this, put all of our kids up front in center. That's why we do these proclamations. That's why we have... Our students highlight this um, and just I, I want this video because I, I want to share this. <laughs> I mean, that's how important. So I think we've all been affected. I, I get where top, Trustee Chavez is coming from. It, it's all affecting us emotionally because it's so important that we break down those bullying and the the kids jokes and that it be, goes beyond that. And we all need to be valued. And every time we do one of these proclamations, it's to highlight front and center that we're all part at the tapestry that you're talking about. Uh, we're all part of our district. We're all part of our community. And I, I just, it was so touching to hear these, these two students and it was just wonderful. So great job. Really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And to um, Trustee Griffin's point too, um, this just also reiterates our interconnectedness, our interdependence. We are all, we're an intersected society. Um, Disability is another beautiful part of human diversity, and we should celebrate that. So, yes, thank you, and thank you to Dr. Wade for um, for bringing this forward. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that. Excellent, excellent. Um, are there any questions or comments from the public? There are none. Great. I'd like to make a motion to um, 
to adopt the Autism Awareness Month proclamation. I, I second that. Thank you. So we have a motion by Trustee Land and a second by Trustee Chavez. Trustee Griffin, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. Trustee Land? Aye. And our student board reps? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And I vote aye. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. Okay. And now we're on to item five, the Adult Education Week pro proclamation. Thank you very much. So tonight is the San Mateo Adult and Career Education's ESL graduation. I got to go to it uh, earlier this evening for just a minute before dashing back over here, but it was really, really phenomenal. Uh, it was so great to see their smiling faces and, and all of our educators uh, that support the program. Um, and we wanna take this opportunity to bring a proclamation to our board to recognize uh, Adult Education Week. Uh, one of our adult education students, uh, Helena uh, Holeni, I don't know if I said that right, I'm trying, uh, will read the proclamation. I also wanna say thank you to Angela Taylor, our director of, of the San Mateo Adult and Career Education for her work on the proclamation and the entire team over there. Just really great and was so touching this evening. So thank you for including me, but please welcome. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Okay. San Mateo Unified School District Proclamation recognizing April 7 mm -hmm. to 13, 2024 as Adult Education Week. Whereas the state of California will observe April 7 through April 13, 2024 as Adult Education Week, recognizing the unique accomplishments of California adult schools. And both, whereas both of California state legislature and our district acknowledges that K-12 based adult schools offer quality programs to meet the ever-changing economic and workforce development and lifelong learning needs of our diverse state. And the, whereas the first recorded adult education class in California was held in the basement of St. Marie's Cathedral in San Francisco in 1856. The class was authorized by the San Francisco Board of Education to teach English to Irish, Italian, Italian and Chinese immigrants. John Sweat, who was the first volunteer teacher for the class, later became the state superintendent of public instruction. And whereas adult school have been used of numerous occasions to assist the state as it dealt with significant social, political, and economic issues through job training programs during World War II, immigration reform of the 1980s, and most recently, the Great Recession. And whereas adult education in California overcame its biggest challenges as a result of severe economic crisis facing both the state and the nation in 2000. 8 to 2009. Funding that was previously reserved to adult education was redistributed to other levels of education in the state, resulting in many adult schools decreasing in size and some closing. And whereas there are currently over 600,000 adult learners enrolled in ESL classes at adult school across California that are in the age range to have children in our public school system. The impact of adult education is felt across generations, particularly for early childhood learners who have been characterized as priority of the governor and legislature. And whereas San Mateo career and adult education successfully serves San Mateo County and the surrounding communities through its collaboration with its community college partners and community-based organization through the adult education system. San Mateo Career and Adult Education served 3,710 students in the 2022 to 2023 school year. And whereas San Mateo Career and Adult Education provides significant and varied classes and programs, including classes in healthcare training, computer technology training, job preparation classes, high school diploma and equivalency program, English as second language classes, citizenship classes, and more. And whereas San Mateo career and adult education served 268 students in the high school diploma and GID programs in the 2022 to 2023 school year. 
The programs help minimize the high school dropout rate. Nine students earned their high school diploma and 13 students earned their GID in the 2022 to 2023 school year. And whereas San Mateo Career and Adult Education serve 2,930 students in the English as a Second Language program in the 2022 to 2023 school year. And parents enrolled in ESL classes learn how to assist their children with schoolwork and dedicate several hours a year tutoring their own children. And whereas San Mateo Career and Adult Education provides a safe environment for its students free from discrimination or bullying, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. And whereas Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, San Mateo career and adult education continue to provide critical programming and services to our adult education students and their families via literacy and basic skills to help ensure our students were successful as they navigated the challenge of distance learning to finish the school year. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the San Mateo Union High School District recognized the week of April 7 to April 13, 2024 as Adult Education Week and salutes the teachers, administrators, classified staff and students of adult education programs in our district and statewide, honoring their efforts, persistence and accomplishments. San Mateo Union High School District passed and adopted on the <clears throat> 28th day of March, 2024. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I will open it up to the trustees. Is there, are there any comments? I will start with Trustee Griffin. I'll <laughs> Trustee. pass and see if somebody else will okay. have a comment. Trustee Chavez. Say thank you for, you did an amazing job of reading that. Thank you. Trustee Jacobson. Well done reading. I'm I'm glad that we have these programs available. Um, my neighbor is from Ukraine and has been taking the English classes, and it's I, I'm happy to know that it's so accessible to so many. Trustee Lind. I just want to say thank you. Wonderful reading. Um, what I find so touching is just tonight the diversity of our students. Mm -hmm. Students come in all forms mm -hmm. and diverse backgrounds, and it's just wonderful to just see how diverse we have. And it was just amazing tonight. So, and thank you so much for doing tonight's proclamation. Yeah, thank you, I echo that. Um, we have an excellent, excellent district. And thank you to Principal Taylor too, for everything that you do for the students and just the hard work that all the students put in. My parents both attended the San Mateo um, Adult School when they first came from Guatemala. And um, it, it was a game changer. They were able to get really good jobs and um, continue their, their life here. So excellent, thank you. Um, okay, are there any questions or comments from the from the public? There are none. Great, um, I'd like to entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to um, adopt the Adult Education Week proclamation. Great. I'll second that. Motion by Trustee Land, second by Trustee Chavez. Trustee Griffin, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. Trustee Land? Aye. Uh, student board reps? Aye. Aye. And I vote aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to the consent agenda. Um, do any of the trustees, well, now it's time if you'd like to pull something, Trustee Jacobson? I'd like to pull item nine. Okay. Approval of new novels. Great. Are there any other? Anybody wanted to pull? No? I'd like okay. to make a motion as amended for the consent agenda. I'll second the motion. Well, let me, okay, okay. There weren't any uh, comments from the public? There are none. Okay, great. Okay. So, Trustee Griffin, uh, Trustee Land moved to um, approve the items that were not pulled. And Trustee Griffin, did you second it? Yes. Okay, great. And um, Trustee Griffin, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. Trustee Land? Aye. And I vote aye. Um, so motion carries. Okay. Um, now we'll go on to item nine. 
Um, so let me see. Hold on, let me. Can you scroll up a little more? Yeah, that's okay. Um, okay. Is there any um discussion? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, I really appreciated the the effort that was put forward in this document. Um, I appreciated reading what the English teachers, their rationales for selecting these novels and any potential um, content that might be problematic. I also appreciated the, the wide range of, um, I don't know how to say it, the wide range of characters and themes and periods, time periods that and ethnicities that were represented um, the thought that was taken in evaluating these novels for culturally responsiveness. I just had a question. Um, there are a couple, there's one called No Exit. It says that the setting could be problematic for students who are religious and might pose a situation where students could opt out. I just wanted to understand what is the um, the pol the policy or the procedure for students opting out of novels that um, might be problematic for for them or their families. So um, what I'll say is that if there's a novel that has like sensitive topics or topics that could be triggering for students for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. um, we ask teachers to kind of prompt that either in their syllabus or um, in advance of reading the novel. And what often is offered, um, I don't know how long this, I'm not super familiar with this particular novel, so I don't know how long it is. If it is a novel that um, isn't tremendously long, I guess you could opt out of it. Sometimes what you might also do is have an alternative assignment for the student during the part of the novel that might be um, something that the family or the student would opt out of, um, because if it's a, a scene that may be too much for them to read, that's oftentimes how you would have them opt out of it. Mm -hmm. um, what we try to do is not have it be a moment where the student feels excluded in the classroom. So whatever we can do so that they can stay a part of the conversation and the discussions and the assignments and those types of things. Um, I would say oftentimes it's done on an individualized basis, you know, based on what comes up for the students. Um, I can certainly look at this book a little bit more closely, but I know our teachers went through a pretty extensive review process where mm -hmm. they um, had two members read it and then they used a rubric to kind of uh, vet the books. Um, we also look for books that have won awards, you know, based on their literary kind of accomplishments. So oftentimes the books are um, have really complex characters and have storylines that are really acknowledged by the um, literature world as being, you know, of really great um, literature, I guess is what I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a process that we'd offer for um, students to have alternative assignments for the different parts of the novel that might be um, triggering or challenging for them for, you know, a variety of reasons. Okay. Thank you so much. I yeah. appreciate that explanation. Is there are there any other questions or any more discussion from the board? Okay. Um, is there are do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, are there any uh questions or comments from the public? There are none. Okay. Um can I just yeah. I was looking at no it's Jean Paul Sartre, right? Is the author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just making sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to make sure because I was well, it's weird because the author is listed as Taylor Adams. And that's just but, it. There's two versions. That's okay. what I was trying to get at. Because Jean-Paul Sartre is the famous French author and existentialist. And so I was wondering if that's the book or is it? He's the subject of the book. Mm -hmm. Subject of the book. Yeah, he's okay. in the book. But the author is Taylor, I think, or whatever the mm -hmm. other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's it's a little confusing as well. Correct. And we're not talking about that. Correct. I just wanted to make some clarifications. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sure. Sorry. I would like to, what's that? I was just going to say real quickly, I, I do appreciate the fact that we have teacher review notes on, on all of them. So that's helpful. Yeah. No, I totally appreciate it. I was mm -hmm. just trying to mm -hmm. clarify for myself. Anyway, I, 
Do we need to make a motion to approve this? Yes. So I make Sir. a motion to approve these novels. Thank you. Second. Okay. A, we have a motion by Trustee Land and a second by Trustee Griffin. Trustee Griffin, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Trustee Chavez? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. Trustee Land? Aye. And I vote. Oh, and trust, I'm sorry. My uh, student board reps? <laughs> aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, and I vote aye. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, going on to regular reports, um, the report of the superintendent. Go ahead. Uh, point of order. Do we need to approve the rest of the consent or did we already we do, do that? that? Yeah. Okay. We did it first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that we're two days before spring break and it's a big deal. Uh, everyone needs a, a break and a rest. And as I've said many times, uh, especially for our students out there and our educators, uh, this is often an opportunity where you can do a little bit of reflection and hit that reset button if you need to and come back uh, on, on Monday after next week. Different if you want. It's the greatest thing, one of the greatest things about education, all of us, whether you're a student or, or an educator, uh, you can always hit that reset button and let go of that baggage or things you didn't like or don't want to keep doing or whatever it might be. Um, and oftentimes I reflect on, during spring break, I reflect on uh, the school year and, and things that I want to do different in my leadership or with my teams, uh, things I want to do different for the remaining two months of school. Uh, and a big push for our seniors. Uh, you know, I talk about every student thrives and every student graduates. And so really a, a, a push on making sure our seniors graduate. And if they're not on track to graduate, then we have a plan for them post-secondary uh, so that they can achieve their goals and thrive. So um, with that said, we just wrapped up our WASC process. I know Trustee Chavez talked a little bit about that. Uh, WASC is an acronym for the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, and it's an accreditation body. Uh, this, this organization uh, comes on to high schools across the state of California, actually broader than just California, uh, multiple states, and they basically hold up a mirror. Uh, we do a self-study, a report of who and what and why we are and what our goals are and what are the things we do really, really well and where we need to improve. And hopefully when the accreditation committee arrives, all they do is reflect back at us. If we did a real, uh, just an amazing job with fidelity, they're just reflecting back what we wrote. Uh, that's, that's really our hope that they don't come to us and say, oh, you missed this and you missed that and you need to do this and you need to do that. And based uh, preliminarily on, on the, the draft reports, uh, our, our teams did such an outstanding job through that entire process uh, that the reports are coming back uh, really identical to what we uh, produced. Uh, this, this work absolutely takes every member of the school community working together to be successful. It's not just our teachers, it's our classified uh, educators, it's our administrators, students, families, AFSCME, me. Uh, everybody. Uh, so I want to just say thank you to all the educators at our school sites uh, for their engagement and support, making all parts of this process successful. A special thank you to our WASC coordinators uh, who did an amazing job at Aragon High School. Uh, uh, and if I, I'm going to try to get the names right, Amelia Sa Salis, Burlingame, Shannon Couch, Cappuccino, Adam Faber, Hillsdale, James Madison, Mills, Serena RG, and San Mateo, David Peary. Um, Awesome, awesome, awesome job. It is a year's worth of work. Um, I, they hold it all together. Um, and I'm really, really grateful. Um, we owe just a tremendous debt of gratitude. And I hope we don't have to do it again for another six years. Um, uh, okay. And and um, yeah, so just, so just big thanks. And one more plug for our adult education ESL graduates. They were adorable. And I'm so proud of them. Uh, they worked so, so hard. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now, um, our report from our student board representatives. Uh, so during our last student board meeting on the 20th, we had like a really interesting discussion with uh, Trustee Kemke. Uh, it was on the Local Control Accountability Plan, or LCAP. And it was just really a great discussion. I feel like both sides learned a lot in which, we're, uh, well, we shared our experiences and perspectives in 
like as students and kind of what helps our learning and areas of improvements that could kind of better optimize our classroom environment. And we also like just kind of discussed strategies that just help students kind of get a better focus and understanding of course content. Uh, also, it was just really great learning the behind the scenes of teacher work days and like the data the school uses and like just the stuff our, our teachers are learning to help us learn. So thank you for uh, coming to talk about that with us. That was great. First of all, I want to apologize for being late. Um, both of my parents were pretty busy, so I had to get here myself the three oh, miles. Um, so I am very sorry about that. And the alarm was me cooking the rice. So very sorry for the multiple disruptions. Um, yeah. At, at the last board meeting, we also reviewed um, the Brown Act special session. Um, and we also discussed and prepared for the Let's Talk in May again, another event at, I believe, the Millbrae Community Center. And we will have several student board members volunteering there to share perspectives at the event. So we're super excited for that. Um, also, this will be um, our last meeting here. And so we've chosen the representatives who will be coming in April and the following months, which will be Hiroki and Frida. And yeah, apart from that, we did like a deep dive on like the LCAP and it was super interesting to hear about what Ms. Kemke had to say and share our own perspectives. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you for your report. Um, okay, going on to report from the District Teachers Association rep, Mr. Childress. Good evening, President Andrade Zuniga, members of the board, district cabinet. Um, uh, Superintendent Booker stole a little bit of my thunder. Um, I just did want <laughs> to recognize um, all of the work that uh, the teachers have been um, engaged in in the last, oh, I don't know, six months, eight months. Um, really, a WASC year is a WASC year. And um, but it can't be overstated how much support we get from the folks who are in those positions, who are the coordinators at our sites. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, Superintendent Booker mentioning um, all the folks who really pulled it all together. Um, Wask is a is I I really appreciate his his analysis or his perspective and saying that it's really a mirror and you know looking back on ourselves and um, all of our schools have done so well in serving our students in this community it's um, it's really impressive so uh, thank you for that um, and it is a time of year that you know we're we're nearing the end we've 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 we're, we have one sixth of the year left and um, it, it, sometimes, uh, you know, folks who are outside of education might might talk to teachers or other educators and say, oh, well, you must just be winding down and everything's going to be great. And this is the time when, you know, <laughs> we're really sort of gearing up for the big press, the last the last stretch. It's that last it's that last commitment to to making sure everybody makes it over the line. Um, college acceptances are coming out. Um, AP, everybody's getting ready for AP tests. Um, capstone projects of all types at all schools. Um, it's it's a really exciting time of year, and for that reason. Um, I also agree with, uh, and he again stole my thunder a little bit. But uh, spring break is really a welcome, um, a welcome uh, opportunity to uh, both reflect, reset, and uh, recover uh, for the rest of the year. Um, teachers are excited. Teachers are 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 uh, engaged, and um, it's always a great time of year. But it's always important to remember that we've got that one more step to push over the line. Um, I also want to recognize that uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, we, we have reopening negotiations starting in the next month in April, and we're meeting on the 12th of April, and hopefully we can come together and find common ground on a lot of things, um, and hopefully move forward with what's best for all bargaining units and and uh that's all so good luck with spring break <laughs> thank you um going on to the report of the csea chapter 519 representative miss clements
You can unmute and begin, Ms. Clemens. I think this is a little better. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all, and I uh, hope you're having a good evening. You'll um, be glad to know that I have a very short report this evening. I would like to say, as far as our business goes, status quo, we're still working on the same items that I mentioned last week. So I'll take this opportunity to give a huge shout out, shout out to our classified staff who are diligent every day, working to keep everything absolutely fantastic at each of our school sites. It's those uh, employees, whether you see them or not, they make sure that we have the most beautiful, inviting, and, um, you know, I had this written down somewhere, um, fabulous school sites that would make anyone proud to come to work, proud to be at school. So it's fabulous for teachers as well as students. And it just gives you a lot of pride to see how wonderful everything can come together with the support that our classified staff provides the teaching staff with the students as needed and whatever thing they're doing, activity they're providing. And all in all, it makes it for a very conducive life or situation for positive learning and living, which makes school the positive event. It should be. So that'll do it for me. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, and there's no report from the adult school, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go on to special reports and appearances. Um, spotlight on student learning, Dr. Kemke. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees. Um, I'm here tonight to share the third and final spotlight on student learning. Um, Brian, Mr. Sims is here to share some of the information around um, our student survey which and family survey on perceptions of school climate, equity, and bias. Um, this is one of the um, surveys that we developed um, in the, during the pandemic, essentially to get a better understanding of how our students are experiencing school. We worked with Panorama, which is the platform we use for these surveys to develop some really important questions about students' experiences on campus. Um, we also have tonight, very um, excited to have some of our student equity um, council members here um, as part of the data that we're sharing is data that um, we're tracking very closely and a lot of the work that they're doing at the schools is related to um, disrupting hate speech on our campuses as well as other equity projects that they've chosen. So we have um, a student equity council teams from both Mills and Cappuccino who are gonna share some of their work. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so as always, this is related to our equity vision, um, thinking about how we ensure students are learning in an equitable environment. A lot of these questions are specific to students' identities, their backgrounds, their interests as individuals. So it really does give us data around how well we're doing on, um, you know, towards this vision. Um, and also it helps us identify, you know, the barriers, the um, different biases that we might have as an institution, both through the questions. And then there's some free response there that I don't think we've quite gotten through all of that data quite yet, but um, oftentimes the schools, the school level and us at the district level uses this data to um, kind of guide our, our work um, towards becoming a more equitable environment. Um, this does cover two of our LCAP goal areas. Um, both our um, work around creating authentic relationships and sharing safe and connected communities for our students. Um, again, all of the data that we share through the year, instead of doing just that mid-year LCAP report, we share the data through the year um, as the data is comes out and try to do it in context with um, you know stuff that's going on at the school. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Simmons. Oh, good evening, trustees. Uh, President Andrade Zuniga, 
board members, uh, cabinet. Um, this slide, just a quick reminder um, of the focus of the surveys. Um, and again, this is actually all three surveys we administer. We administer surveys to uh, staff and families in the fall. And then um, students, we actually do a survey, which I talked about the last time back in January, kind of about how they're how they how things are going at the beginning of the school year then this survey is really the the core survey that we administer to understand students sense of climate um throughout now that now that new students new to our schools have been there for for some period of time um you know and it really is focused on on issues of school climate equity hate speech um and honestly that the hate speech piece really comes out of our response to the the grand jury report from many years ago um really trying to make sure we're paying attention to and getting getting concrete feedback from students about their perceptions of, um, of, of issues of hate speech on our campuses. Oh. Okay. Um, so these are some bright spots, as you can see in this slide, uh, the, the two key metrics that we're tracking, you know, so there's an element of this that is, that is our, um, that is our, uh, our LCAP metrics, right? So our LCAP has about 23 discrete metrics. Many of them are academic measures like, you know, graduation rate and things like that. Um, but there's a couple of key questions that are here and it looks like this slide didn't get updated, but that's okay. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, and there, the data is in the actual report, the long report that you all that was submitted with this item. Um, and that is students' positive perception of their relationships with their teachers. And the, and the other one is the extent to which they are seeing adults respond po proactively to incidents of hate speech on our campuses. Uh, and while our, our relationship metrics uh, improved a year over year, and that's that did tick up a bit over the last couple of years, which is good news because that's one we've been paying attention to and we've talked about before um, in this setting. Um, um, and that, but with regard to student to proactive kind of adult response to incidents of hate speech, it's basically flat. It was fifty percent last year. It's forty nine percent this year. Um, still not where we'd like to see it um and and certainly look to improve both of these uh, measures as they're still you know well under the, the you know a, a significant majority of students which is what we'd really like to see favorable responses around but broadly speaking across the student survey um this year the administration um we're seeing uh you know um th that strong level of com completion of the survey i, I just want to acknowledge like that's a big deal getting as you all know as people who probably are asked to complete surveys a lot um, and even though we ask you to do it during a class in many instances, sometimes sometimes students still don't do it. So it's really important to kind of get that number close to 80 percent um, each time we administer. I will say also, if you look at the there's a distribution of the of who actually responded to the survey inside the, the report. And it's pretty representative of the student population overall. It's not sort of really particularly disproportionate in the area. I want to just acknowledge that's that's an important piece of information. Um, um, I think we 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 see broadly uh, that favorable responses around issues of diversity, inclusion, and improved cultural wellness awareness among students. And again, maybe we'll hear some of that from the students. Uh, meanwhile, in contrast, uh, we noted a need to continue to get as close um, we, to to really um, address the specific needs of BIPOC students. We continue to see these differentials in their favorability outcomes when asked questions about what their you know their experience of their sort of sense of climate of kind of connection and climate on campus. And so we 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 want to acknowledge that that's a reality, and we're going to continue to dig into uh, and we're talking later in this presentation about like what we're doing about it, but. Um, it is definitely continues to 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 lag um, what we their outcomes tend still lag what our what our what their counterparts are see are showing. Um, we also um, really need to continue to see uh, interventions to combat hate speech. And I'm going to come back to this topic in a minute because I think there's also an interesting dichotomy we're struggling with, which is adult thinking about what is happening and what students perceive. They're not together in their thinking. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, it should be noted that then you'll hear this um, a little bit more um, that, you know, there is certainly a need for us to address, you know, kind of creating this ongoing culture of upstanding among our students, because um, they're the ones who are mostly interacting with students, um, you know, in class, out of class, um, on the way to school, all of that. Uh, this slide's a summary of the bright spots uh, that, that, and there's lots more detail, obviously, in the report that accompanies this item. Um, staff, um, and this is really around um, staff um, and family perception. Staff generally feel well equipped to address issues of hate and difference across roles and, and across our campuses. 
Uh, families feel pretty good about the level of respect that they're experiencing when they come on our campuses. It's really great news in terms of the general sense of of, of respect. I will say, I will also say we had a pretty significant increase in family participation this year. It was up to like 1,200 families participated in the survey. So it felt really good about kind of the growth in the number of, of folks. Still not nearly, I mean, we've got 25,000 individual mm -hmm. uh, parents or, or guardians in our student information system. So 1,225,000, there's a gap there, but it's still, um, and those are those are duplicates, right? Because some of those are two family, two or three parent or, or guardian uh, families, but still, um, we're still pretty far away from probably 50% of our families participating in the survey. Again, like a lot of adults, difficult to get surveys done. Um, the... What's So I want to reiterate that what's interesting to note here is that the student perception of staff's ability to address issues of difference in hate speech is much lower than adults. Um, we're actively digging into what that might be responsible for that difference of perception um, and certainly hope to be able to say more about it at the at the um, when we present the new LCAP with some strategies for addressing this, uh, the 24 to 27 LCAP later this spring. Um, in addition, we need to continue to work on improving staff and family participation in the survey, as I said. Um, and finally, we also um, see in this data the continued need to support our BIPOC staff. Um, BIPOC staff, similar to, and, and African-American staff and students in particular, um, have lower favorability marks kind of across these same measures that I was talking about previously. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing about that in just a second. Um, so this slide obviously is a nice summary of the common issues that we see kind of across the three sets of survey respondents. There's a significant variability in survey participation um, across the schools, and that's definitely something we want to work on. While we did get 78%, if you look at the data on school-level participation, we've got some schools that are in the 50s and some schools that are in the 90s. Some really, I want to call out Mills in particular. They had some pretty amazing um, responses. Um, and so, uh, it, so their data is really valid for them, right? It's really representative of their student population. Um, the, the surveys highlight this concern around, you know, hate, hate motivated speech. Um, it continues to dog us as an, as an organization. Um, less than half of the students reported feeling that adults respond in a way that makes them feel safe. Um, and that, and again, this contrasts with staff's perception of that same set of information. We're working through kind of figuring out, and ultimately we, we know that professional learning and, and engagement and, and talking about these things are, are going to be essential to it. Um, both BIPOC students and staff reported lower levels of favorability across the survey, as I said. Um, and while staff feel generally well equipped to address issues of hate speech, there's room for growth and engaging all staff in this survey process. Um, we did see that staff also had, you know, we had classified staff at a lower participation rate. There were some things we'll do next year to make sure that on the PD day, people have time to actually work on the survey. That was the intention, but that didn't quite happen at every school site. So just so we have a really representative sample of staff voice. Um, and then lastly, there's really an implied need in all of this uh, for ongoing training and resources for staff to effectively address issues of hate speech uh, and foster a supportive environment um, for discussing race and cultural difference, difference when, when and where relevant and, and appropriate in our schools. Um, so what are we doing about it, right? Um, so, and this is, you know, ongoing work and it's, a, it's, it's definitely a team effort and a, and a shared commitment across a variety of, of roles in the district. Uh, first, we need to continue to implement our student equity councils and you're going to hear a little bit about more about what they do in just a couple minutes. Um, second, we need to continue implementing our anti-bias strategies. Um, anti-bias strategies, which are focused on supporting our African-American and BIPOC staff in particular um, uh, under Dr. Kemke's leadership and Writing, uh, we got a, a really great grant this last summer, a couple hundred thousand dollars over three years uh, to invest in some some affinity based support for African American staff um, in general to bring them together, give them some fellowship and some connection, um, but also to take on some of the real issues that are not just their responsibility to redress in the district. They they may represent or or feel the the sting of some of the things that are happening, but it's not just their responsibility to make it different. It's all of our responsibility. And so that's something that, that we're really, um, 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 I'm not sure what the word is engaged in really making sure that happens. Um, we uh, obviously need to continue to provide PD for staff on the ideas and the priorities that you all have already laid out for us. I mean, our racial equity board policy is a very clear roadmap for what we need to do across the organization um, to address a lot of the issues that are in this, that, that where we still have areas of improvement to, to make. Uh, we need to continue to leverage the good work of our family engagement coordinators who work with our families, because one of the things that came out of the family survey, which I didn't speak to a few minutes ago, but was this issue of of, of real barriers. And I've been hearing a little bit of it having doing some, some LCAP outreach, going to the LPO meetings, uh, the Latino Parent Organization meetings at CAP and Hillsdale. Um, and I have another one with San Mateo, uh, is that there this this challenge that we've got to do more to try to meet parents where they are, because 
coming to school isn't necessarily a realistic option for all of our families, of course. And so like being creative about how we make that, make those connections um, real and using every tool we have, um, in including their phones <laughs> to, to get, to get to them because it's, that's, it's really critical. And that that's been, that's been a common theme. Um, and then finally, um, we, we really going to leverage the new instructional framework. I mean, I think that is in many ways from a certificated staff perspective, that's our kind of core strategy for getting at creating the kinds of classroom environments and kind of teaching practice, um, that really, uh, is a kind of culturally responsive um, practice that engages and supports students both in in the interpersonal interactions they're having in class, but really creating the kind of school environments where they they become upstanders. You know, and again, it's not the only way to do it because I think the work the Student Equity Council students are doing is going to be a piece of it as well. But certainly, what teachers do in the classroom is going to be really critical. Uh, and it's great having teacher leaders leading that work and really leaning in hard. We were in a session earlier today uh, with them, really talking about that work. So with that, I'm the least important or interesting part of this whole thing. Um, I want to turn it over to the presentation to the to the members of the Student Equity Council uh, from Cappuccino, who are going to go first. Well, I think you, maybe you all want to come up. Are you, to Angela and Kira, are you going to say introduce your students first? I think you're up, you're up first. They're going to introduce themselves. All right. All right. Perfect. So students from Cappuccino, I don't know your names, but you'll introduce yourselves and take it away from there. Nice. Thank you. Welcome. I can advance the slides. for you. Okay. Thank you. All right, are we ready? Hi, I am Dana. My name's Yesenia. And I'm Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of Abraham, we are here representing Cappuccino Student Equity Council of 2024. So we are a fairly large group, I would say. We have 16 students. We're very diverse. We have about 11 ethnicities represented between among all of us. And we have meetings every Wednesday. So that adds up to about 250 minutes per month. Based on the Pemerana data that we collected earlier this semester, we have 17% of our population that feels excited to come to class in Cappuccino. We have 38% of our student population that has a sense of belonging, and unfortunately, an 81% of our population that has been a target of hate speech. A little bit about Student Equity Council. We have three parts to our community. We have team meetings every Wednesday during homeroom where we have community circles and we kind of talk about our feelings as well as as a representation of how our students are feeling. And we try to tackle experiences and issues that are going on around campus where the student voices. And then we also have tier one meetings where we go to meetings with staff once a month and admin and we bring the student voice. We try to help them bring take initiative and how to fix kind of some issues that we are facing from our point of view because the teachers don't necessarily feel what we feel and so we're trying we're that kind of help to push them and help them make that change yeah um, some of the initiatives that we are taking are improving data data collection such as not taking a lot of surveys because we are all pretty much surveyed out. So we don't <laughs> want to take a lot of surveys. <laughs> um, another one is highlight individual strengths, such as making workshop Wednesday, where we invite a student and teachers to join to like sign up to teach something that they are willing to teach and that they passion a, a lot. Something else that we are aiming for is generating the margins, making insignificant, how do we say it? I lost the word. Statistically insignificant group ethnicities more represented since there is a lot of like one ethnicities only faced because they have a majority in our school. So we wanna make sure the little ethnicities are well represented everywhere. And also we want to build norms because there's a lot of bad words coming around and really degenerating vocabulary that we do not stand. And we wanna make sure that people who are doing this know that they are doing something bad and that they can own up to their mistakes. So yeah. Um, 
Um, this is a quote by me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please. Excellent. As a high school senior, I personally love Student Equity Council because we get to better our school for future generations. See, Zuniga's man, they're awesome. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Kira Bajira. I just want to say I'm I'm their uh I want to say facilitator. I, I really want to center their voices all the time. Um, but I just want to thank you the um the Union High School District because you've allowed us to have these groups, um, especially during our kickoff. You know, they met students from Mills High School. We had a really great time. Um, and as Mr. Simmons was saying, like they have a different perspective than adults do. And it's really valuable to have them at the center of our conversations. Um, and, uh, I'm just really proud of them. These are our three seniors. And so they're going to start recruiting after spring break ends. Um, we have members of every grade level in our school and Excellent. Uh, we just appreciate you, uh, like letting them have this space and yeah. giving them the opportunity to talk to adults. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Pajira and team. Uh, yeah, and now, uh, Ms. Zink, you want to come on up? Ms. Zink, that's... Dove, that's Dove, Alex sorry, Dove. Alex Dove, that's sorry. Alex Dove. Younger than me, so I like that. You take that again? I'm, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize, sorry. It's me into a different sorry. decade. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you again. Um, one of the things that I really um, am appreciative of about Student Equity Council, I think this is my third year with Mills High School, is the ability to really connect with our peers in the district. It really gives our students that opportunity to really tap into their collective efficacy. Um, Student Equity Council was really born out of a need to see that we had a lot of marginalized students, students who were not often centered um, in the experiences of our high schools and to really um, make sure and intentionally give them a space to share their voice because we believe that all students, you know, are important and um, especially our students who have largely been often overshadowed by the traditional high school experience. So um, I'm really proud of our work and it feels like, you know, the first year it was kind of figuring out what we were doing and then we we're starting to get the ball rolling and it feels like this year we're really starting to make some moves. So we're really excited. I have two of my amazing students to talk about two of our um, foci that we've been working on at Mills High School. So um, after gathering data, feedback, also using the panorama survey, which across the board, we're seeing a lot of similar student experiences of the disconnect, um, et cetera, et cetera. Our group split into two subgroups, one that really wanted to work on highlighting and centering um, through a visual media, um, our diversity on our Mills campus and our other group that really wanted to work on interrupting dehumanizing language because they really saw that as something that was incredibly important. So my first student is Bruce, who's gonna come talk about the mural. And then Reese is on Zoom, so she'll be, um, nope, she's up there and she's ready to speak after. All right. Uh, is there a way we could go to the next slide? Yeah. So that is currently our murals project. Ooh, sorry. Okay. Hooray. Uh, that is currently our mural project. Um, basically, the purpose of this mural is to just add a lot of representation and explore, uh, what is it, our diverse groups that live within those uh, high school. And uh, what is it? Ooh. Okay. On that left side... Uh, what is it? We represented our uh, cultural assemblies and also a lot of uh, cultural extracurriculars. Um, we have a lot of cultural clubs, so we just thought it would be really cool to like represent them in this painting. Uh, one of them is like the, was it the Chinese dance? Oh, Ch Dragon Dance Club, I think. Yeah. And we just thought it would be cool to implement all these things into this big painting that's like I don't know, like seven feet by 16 oh sorry 11 inches sorry feet um but yeah it's pretty big and we just thought that it'd be really important to you know emphasize the awesomeness of diversity in our uh, what is it in our school but yeah that's pretty much the gist of it so and this is something they've been working on um, that they started sketching after, you know, responding to and then getting feedback from their peers of their community. And with the um, 
encouragement or with you know suggestions from the students. This is the sketch that they've developed and it's gonna go in our theater. So whenever you all come to see our beautiful Mills productions, Bye Bye Birdie coming up soon. Um, but whenever you're coming to Mills, you'll get to see it and it'll be centered and highlighted and really representing the diversity of Mills and how proud we are of our cultures in our groups. Mm -hmm. Um, me and also <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay well we do have a what is it every wednesday we usually have meetings uh so we can have some sort of like what is it participants who want to actually work on the mural but otherwise it's mostly just me and <laughs> other and this one other person but unfortunately they quit so <laughs> oh no is, is that miss <laughs> dove in the lower right yes oh my god amio yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'm representing the adults because the adults Aww, are yeah. yeah, that's true. That's great. Not the most amazing. important though. Really? Yeah, the yeah, sketch is amazing. Wow, yeah. it's really good. So yeah, it's something that they're gonna continue. So now that we've sketched it, they're gonna be painting it in these final weeks, and we're hoping to get it out into full production by the end of the year or next year. Yeah. And now Reese is gonna be speaking about our protocol to interrupt dehumanizing language. Um, can you oh. guys hear me? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Reese Roach, and I'm a junior here at Mills. I'm leading the other subcommittee of SEC, and our focus is um, eliminating non-inclusive language. So we identified this as a prominent issue last semester, and we are currently taking um, various measures in response. Um, so we recognize that combating the casual use of slurs and offensive language is critical, and we're dedicated to creating an environment where such words and phrases have no place. Um, so that's why we're looking to approach it through kind of an educational lens. We want students to truly recognize the um, impact of their words as opposed to just complying or fearing disciplinary action. Um, and we can't always ensure that teachers and admin interfere as needed. So um, my committee and me believe that it's up to students to take action. Um, so we aspire to promote a culture of acceptance, diversity, and mutual respect, um, both inside and outside the classroom. Uh, so currently, um, me and my committee, we're working on an infographic for teachers to put up, kind of um, as they do in the beginning of the school year, with, you know, some resources. Um, we've created a student protocol and some community guidelines, and um, we're also developing curriculum for an assembly next year and hopefully to put on a required module on Canvas, uh, and in which we're gonna consider the panorama survey data, and we're also planning to conduct our own to guide our work. Um, so yeah, ultimately I hope that our curriculum and stuff is good and that other schools in the district will look to implement it possibly or take similar action. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, both schools, amazing work, uh, it's ongoing. I want to acknowledge that um, these were only two of all the schools, all schools have these, they're taking on different foci, some similar foci too around dehumanizing language, but anyway, I wanted to acknowledge these are just two, there's others, we may have them come another time, so uh, anything you want to add? Um, I'll also say Peninsula and Middle College also have um, some teams. Great. Great. So now we'll answer Thank questions. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open it up for the trustees to give any comments or questions. Trustee Griffin, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, you know, the that statistic at the front that 81% of, of um, people had experienced, I think it was... One more. The, yeah. yeah. That have been a target of hate speech. That is just really... Yeah. Impact, I guess impactful would be the word. It's hard to fathom that. I mean, that's like four out of five in this room. Somebody is yeah. hurling insults at them and hurting their feelings and, you know, creating conflict. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think this is one of those deals. And I actually want to hear some more from the students. Maybe mm -hmm. they can brainstorm. Uh, and I, I can see, I see them looking like, well, what are we going to, where are we going? You know, I think <laughs> in order to solve, at least at the student level, you know, and it's got to be student driven. And I'm kind of thinking it doesn't really need to be 
it needs to be a program, but it needs to be really something in the in the day to day culture, people getting attitudes, looking at people when they step out of bounds and speaking up and that kind of stuff. And I kind of want to hear, are there any ideas that the students may have how you can, you know, where it, it, it needs to be everyday life that you respect people and not kind of like, well, we got to think about the policy and the poster that's back there in the back of the classroom. You know, we got to change all this stuff. So I just, do the students have any ideas how you can just make it part of your daily, your day-to-day -day life? I can really change things up. That's a good question. Hi. Um, I think that it's really important just to communicate with our student body because most of the time, the way that I see it is that a lot of students have become really comfortable with using many words that just aren't respectful to anyone, even if it's like on your own. Um, I think that we just need it as a whole community try and just to have a serious conversation because having, you know, 81% of our population at Cappuccino been targeted by hate speech, that to me is not okay at all. You know, I don't think we should have any percent at Cappuccino being targeted by hate speech. And it's just not acceptable at all. And I think that as a community, we just need to come to an agreement and be just nice to each other because at the end of the day, it's who we surround ourselves with that will actually make an impact in our lives, whether we want it to or not. I think that we just have to be more serious about it. And as much as they'll probably sit down and feel that they're being kind of like wronged in a way, they need to understand that these things are not okay and that there has to be a change. And if we want to make a change, we can't just sit around and just whine and complain about it. We actually have to take a stand and we have to say something because if no one says anything and we're all just gossiping about it, nothing will actually be done. So I think that we should maybe open it up to the public and see what they need from us. Because as a council, I mean, I have been a target and I don't know what maybe other people have experienced. I know what I've experienced, but I don't know what other people have experienced. And I think it's important that we all understand what everyone else has experienced so we can take empathy to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I just wanted to add a little bit on to what Yesenia said. I think the biggest issue is that students aren't educated on what they're saying and that and that it's a problem. A lot of from what I hear from my peers, they use it in a joking way, but they don't understand that it triggers certain people, even if it doesn't trigger them or the person they're directing it at, it can trigger other people in the community. And the biggest thing what I can make a connection to was um, my junior year history teacher, she taught us all about um, some racial slurs and we had a whole unit on them. And to me, me personally, I really took it back like, wow, I'd never thought of how, like, even though I've never said those type of words, but I've still never thought how actually like bad the situation behind the story, the history behind these words are. And that's the issue what I believe is in our peers, how nobody really thinks about the actual problem and the actual reasoning that this is a problem and that it's bad. And so, as you said, you said, we need to come together as a community and somehow figure out a way to educate our students. And even though, yes, it might be a hard sit down talk that nobody really wants to do because it's might be uncomfortable, but we need to step out of this little box and we cannot just be, it, we, it has to be done. It's not, oh, we're not comfortable. We're not going to do it. It's a topic that has to be addressed. And without addressing it, nothing, nothing's going to change. No one's going to listen to what you just say, oh, it's a bad thing. That's it. They're not going to listen. It needs to be specifically directly addressed to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I personally think that there's two things we could do. One is the acknowledgement part. Um, I, do, I think definitely having more assemblies and also like maybe reinforcing our, uh, what is it, ethnic studies uh, unit and like just educating these students on how their like behavior is just super harmful. Because I will say, 
not a lot of people are doing this maliciously. They're doing this out of like genuine ignorance. If they're saying slurs and stuff, they're doing it because they just genuinely don't know that it's harmful. But I will say that there is a considerable amount who are doing, who are saying this language because of nonchalantness. Um, they just don't care about us. And I will say the second thing that I also want to reinforce is um, I think it's good to also offer more support groups for marginalized communities. Um, in our school, we have like a queer support group. Um, it's basically like, I guess, advised by our wellness team. Um, and basically, it's just where all these groups of uh, queer people, they just gather around. They just like hang out and stuff. Because at some point, we kind of get tired, like arguing about like, hey, can you like care about our rights and stuff like that? We kind of get tired. So I think like it's better to also like comfort ourselves and st for marginalized communities specifically, just take a step back and find some acknowledgement and like just it's important to find comfort with ourselves. So I think offering those spaces are also really important. That's all I got to say. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Reese Hello also again. has her hand up, but in, oh. on the, no, sorry. Hello again. Um, I feel like something that we could do is also make a group with all the teachers informing them that this is happening to our school and that they need to step up. If they hear somebody saying something, they should be able to walk up to that person and take control because we in our school, we see that teachers just are bystanders and they don't go up and hold that student accountable for what they're saying. And I feel like that's something that we as a whole like district should be able to do. Hold the teachers accountable for having the student take not not take responsibility for what they said because that actually hurts students because you never know what they're going through. You have to keep in mind everything that they have been through, all of the experiences that they have been through. You have to make sure that you know that before you say something irrespectful, unrespectful, irrespectful. Disrespectful. 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 You got it. <laughs> yeah. um, we, uh, we just wanted to mention one, one thing about the data. Um, we actually talked about this quite a bit in the equity advisory committee. Uh, the platform's a little confusing. It's actually 19% um, that have been a target of hate speech. So it's the, the reverse. So there's, it's never, a, it can be, it can it's be never an acceptable amount, but it is. Um, yes. So the question is, I've been a target of hate motivated speech or behavior. And it says, 19% of the students say yes, and 81% um, said no um, for cappuccino this last time. And um, still one in five. Right? Still quite a bit of students. So it's still not acceptable, but I just wanted to make sure we clarified that piece. Can I take the, the comment? That's from an important Reese online? Yeah. distinction. Yeah. Reese, you have a comment? Yeah, sorry. I just oh, Reese online. To um, piggyback kind of off of the, some of the CAP students' insight, as well as Bruce um, at Mills, because this is something like we're directly working for. Um, but my committee, we've talked to our um, principal, Ms. Zinsky, as well as our assistant principals, and definitely um, the same sentiments about um, ignorance coming from a lot of students and not knowing, you know, really the impact behind their words. So as I mentioned, um, really through education. Um, like I said, hopefully we're able to finish a curriculum and hopefully share it with other schools as well. Um, but yeah, I just think really, as everyone else has said, you know, informing people about um, the history and impact of their words, because uh, I think we can only do so much. Um, we cannot force people. So it would be good to, you know, inform people and really educate people. Thank you. Uh, as Dana mentioned, I'm also part of the Student Equity Council at Cappuccino. Um, and I just wanted to circle back to the idea of daily practices. Um, I would just like to say I admire how President Zuniga starts uh, the meetings with the uh, land acknowledgement. And I think um, not uh, even though the land acknowledgement is not something that has to do with hate speech, I think the idea of integrating um, some sort of acknowledgement as a, a practice or um, to begin something like this, a meeting, uh, 
is just crucial to highlight just because the way that we start our days at school, I feel like if we integrate some sort of daily practice or something to um, acknowledge that we all go through some sort of issue that whether it's four and five or one of five of students at Cappuccino or any school have been a target of hate speech, that there's um, that those students are not alone for one and two, that there is something that we can do. And the first step is that acknowledgement and uh, the appreciation of our students as a whole. So that's just one quick thing I wanted oh, to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had not anticipated this level of student voice at this meeting. It's really Excellent. awesome. I think it's Excellent. exactly the color you needed from the data. So it's great. Great. Um, uh, yeah, trust each oh, other. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Wait. Oh, uh, you can go ahead if you. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks. So um, I just first want to start out with like you guys, you students, it's just you're, you're, you're so exceptional. It's just your level of awareness for the hate that can be go that that's going on, on our campus is just amazing but I'm kind of curious on how you do outreach with like the masses because I hear you guys talk a lot about like personal deep individual discussions which is great but like what about like a big group of students like our entire student body and uh, I'm also just curious because we have been trying to solve this problem using our ethnic studies at Burlingame High School but What's your solution for people who kind of just let these lessons go in through one year and out the other? Sorry if I bombarded you I with questions. That, was that a, that was a question for the students or or like kind of just you guys in general and how you guys kind of deal with it? Yeah, so I mean I think um I mean I think as a as a district we are continuing to talk about kind of the need to do this. So every single new uh what wasp plan that was just submitted to the to the reviewers um, has some explicit dehumanizing language campaign in it um, or has things like that term, like that phrase, because every school is sort of seeing a version of this. So I think that what we're seeing is a real, a real kind of movement happening. I think students here have been talking about getting assemblies, kind of getting larger groups of students engaged. So I think that, and in many ways, I think students are the are the best. I mean, yes, we have a curriculum in ethnic studies. We have ethnic studies tenants that we try to push throughout the grade levels. We have lots of ways of trying to create understanding. But I think at the end of the day, it is, you know, what you were referring to, what other folks, what the students have said about, you know, we've, it's going to have to be a community effort where people stand up, adults as well. So I want to acknowledge this difference of view that our adults think they're standing up, but students aren't necessarily perceiving that. Um, and so I think it's it's going to it's going to require a, con a concerted effort. I mean, I know we, all of us administrators were in this room back in the fall when one of our, one of the fellow administrators did a whole talk, um, having been, having grown up in the South and sort of the experience of the N-word and what that meant, what it means to an African-American administrator in the district. Um, and what that, and it really was, it was really compelling for all the administrators in the room. I mean, you could hear a pin drop during that presentation. Anyway, so the point is, I think, at all levels of the organization, I think people are trying to take this on and 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 disrupt it where where it is. But I do think it's become incredibly casual and normalized a lot of the language that we're talking about. And and it's gonna take it's gonna take us a while to to root it out. And it's gonna and I appreciate the idea of I mean, I don't think we've talked about a practice in the morning, maybe some kind of way of reminding ourselves together who we are and what we're about. I mean, I really appreciate that. I would just add one thing. If there's students that are repeatedly using words that are dehumanizing, that at some point it, you know, it becomes more than just a conversation and it will be part of, you know, a stronger discipline response that the administrators will take mm -hmm. up. Because, you know, there's one thing if you're using it casually and you're oblivious and you don't understand. But I think to your point, if we know that students are informed about it, there should be some kind of... Um, consequence if you're using language in a way that's hurtful so yeah. All right, cool. mm -hmm. so uh, uh, first i just want to oh well yeah. oh. go ahead we, we can do yeah, research. Ahead, mm -hmm. sorry um i just wanted to answer her question i'm like because something really resonated with me and i wanted to share maybe a way other schools could try this as well um she was asking how can we get it just beyond um, going one ear and out the other because we can just tell people to do stuff. Um, so one thing my school kind of brainstormed um, with our student equity council and with our principals 
um, was after an assembly to go back to whatever class and we would basically have the teachers do an activity or kind of a workshop or case study with students um, in which we would like train them to carry this out um, to really you know have students interact with the content opposed to just listening because I know sometimes at assemblies it doesn't do all of it. So yeah, we're hoping to get teachers in on this um, to do a, an activity after. And okay. also to mandate, or not mandate, but at orientation, people are required to like do modules on Canvas. Um, so that's another approach we're looking to take. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, I have a student board rep, Darren Love. Yeah. He'll stick with it. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts around this dehumanizing language thing and some, and I, I think two things, which is one, more education is actually not always the answer. And I know a lot of people disagree with me on this. Um, and the second is that hate speech is more pervasive than it is reported. At Aragon, I hear the N-word in the hallway every single day. I hear a homophobic joke every single day. I, I even hear Asian slurs and I and my friend group is predominantly Asian. Aragon has a significant Asian population and I still hear Asian slurs every single day. And I know that if you sit down with these students that you know are engaged in hate speech, I know you look you look them in the eye and you're like, hey, well, you, you, you shouldn't be saying this. They I'm sure they know. Right. I don't think it takes more than basic human decency to know that these words are not acceptable in our campus and they're not acceptable in our district. And I think at some point it doesn't come down to, we need more education, we need to raise more awareness. Um, but really, I think that it results kind of from the culture of kind of the students in general, because like you sit down with a student and they know that they are not supposed to use those words, but for some reason it's still become so normalized, right? And it really, and the people, the people that are facing this hate speech, there are two groups of people that mainly um, are these victims of hate speech. One of them is like is like genuine victims, pride, predominantly minority groups. And the second is just people who enjoy using it in a casual setting for, for whatever reason. And I think really, like you talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, uh, did you hear what that person said to me? And, and I'm like, well, you should go tell someone about it. And they're like, they won't care anyways. I, I think that I think that's the real problem here. I think that there is a certain demoralization of the students that are on this campus being faced like well, what what is it like seventeen percent of students sh show up excited for class. And it's not because the, it does not because the teacher isn't good. I love all of my teachers and many students enjoy learning. It's because the environment is not necessarily one that's always receptive to growth. And I think that is why, first of all, it is difficult to maintain action because, yes, the students need to be educated. And, yes, we need to be continuously promoting this hate speech. But I think at some point, even as a prerequisite to tackling this hate speech, I really believe that there needs to be a certain reinvigoration of hope within the student body. That if I actually go to someone and talk about this, I will be heard. I will be supported. And more than that, the culture that kind of perpetuates across the student body, that of one where people are actually supporting each other because people know that this is wrong. You can't tell me that like, oh yeah, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say a slur. There's no way someone thinks that's acceptable. I, I don't think it's ignorance or maybe I just believe in our student body a lot more, but I genuinely don't believe that they don't know that it's wrong. I just think that for some reason, it's become normalized for it to be right. and. Seth Godin um, talks about this kind of idea, this bell curve um, of basically it can be it's applied in marketing. But I find that it also works really well when applied to like any sort of like large group of people, which is that there are the early there are like the early adopters right there are the innovators. Right. I'll call that like the student equity council, right, which every single week you guys show up tirelessly to make your schools a better place. Right. The only problem is that the vast majority of people are on. The other side of the bell curve, which is they are what Seth Godin either calls early or late adopters or laggards. And I think that this is the reason why, well, first of all, this is the reason why continued student collaboration is incredibly important. But I also think 
that that's why this can't just come from the top down. It really needs to be, and again, this is this is more of my thought than like this is exactly what we should do because I, I I don't I don't I really I I'm not really sure what we should do. But what I do know is that there needs to be a shift of culture on campus that and that comes from everybody, right? We have small groups of people doing amazing things, and we also have large groups of people which hear hate speech every single day, especially our minority groups. And I think that moving forward. We just always need to keep continuing to keep all of these people in mind because there is a large majority of people that face hate speech every day and they don't talk about it. You can, the silent majority, right? And so really just moving forward, I think we need to be continuing to promote a culture of positivity, continuing to create change, positive, meaningful change from the bottom up and creating a school community that works for everybody. Thank you. you. Know, can I just... I just want to add something, I, Darren. I really appreciate what you had to say right now, because you know, and all the all the students. To be honest, I mean, the wisdom in this room is just a, is, yeah. is, is has been raised, but the, the students in the room because you know usually it's just the five of us, <laughs> and <laughs> you know everything that you said has such res resonates with me. You know, it's absolutely about a school culture. I mean, I'm a principal, and that's what I see every day, and we all have to be a part of it. And what you're saying makes so much sense. And the idea of the early adopters, you, the innovators, you all are the innovators. You are the visionaries. Don't stop what you're doing because you, you just keep doing what you're doing because that's the only way you're going to get the bell curve to change. And you're going to get that, that we call it critical mass, right? right? We're not at that critical mass yet, which is the, which is what we're striving for. And so I do want to commend staff for the ongoing push in this direction. Yeah. But I will tell you this, we are up against a really steep hill. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, Jocelyn, you said it earlier. It's generation. It's generations. It's right. You are the generation that needs to make the change right. because Absolutely. sadly, hate speech is inherited right. and basically learned behavior from families and generation yeah. of families. Yeah. That is the sad part is it's the genuine history. And while you have that very optimistic view that everybody should know it's wrong, not everybody does mm -hmm. because in their families, it's acceptable and it's done yeah. and they think it's okay. And that's something that we have to teach and unlearn yeah. so many ways. And that's the hill that we have to climb and get over. Um, and so just listening to this conversation is amazing. And so I'm very proud that we had this discussion and we heard so much from the students. So I'm sorry to just kind of go on that, but I was, I was passionate, so passionate. I just had an outburst. So I apologize for not going in order. No, but. And it, no and I completely um, understand what you're saying. And, you know, people ask, why do you do this anti-racist and anti-bias stuff? Well, this is why, because it's, it's generational. It's, it's, it's embedded in the culture that we live in and our society and it needs to change. Um, and if we don't address it, if we're not honest about it, then it's not going to change. So thank you, though. Thank you, all of you, for 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 talking about it. Um, Trustee Lynn is right. You will be the generation that will have to change it. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any, I'll just, it'll be a free-for-all. Go ahead. Anybody that wants to make a comment? Uh, we haven't gone yet, but um, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. okay. No, no, I know you had something to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, um, well, I had some comments to make, but I will just say this. I am impressed with all of our students. Having your voice, our two trustees, Jocelyn, Jocelyn and, and um, Darren, speak up, as well as our students from Cappuccino. And I think we lost one, or maybe they're over there from, uh, yeah, from Mills, right? Um, just Excellent. I, I can't say enough about our students. And I'll tell you, I know we have our student board reps right here with their microphone. Every single one of our students and also the ones who were, were virtual through Zoom. Um, you guys look really good at the podium there. You guys really have your strong voice, all of you. And I just want to say that uh, we, we want more of our students up there. But I just think these are our leaders right here. You're our leaders. I want to see you at the podium on, on TV. I want to see you guys, at Senator. Who knows? The sky's the limit, right? President, right? Um, I want to mention, I also want to thank uh, Ms. Dove and, and Ms. Bajira for, for bringing the students and, and leading them and, and I leading them in this effort, right? Thank you, because you guys are corralling them, and, and right? Right. Um, 
And, and all the, the other school sites that aren't here. I know we have this same student yeah. equity council, and I just think it's 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 amazing to ha to have your voice there. I think the student voice is the most important, and um, I'm happy that we had eight seventy eight percent participate um, in the student survey. And I know some of the parent par parents, maybe the participation rate was less because they're busy. But I but I do appreciate the student participation rate, and and I can understand why seventeen percent feel excited about going to class and. More than 80% don't because it's it's going to the class with students that don't respect you or don't have empathy or don't, you know, um, not make you feel not accepted, you know. And I mean, in addition to the hate speech and, and the racial um, biasness, is that a word, biasness? Uh, um, I know that some students, I've, I've witnessed students make fun of other students because of their weight or the clothes they're wearing. So it goes, it goes even beyond that. But I know we, we can't yeah. solve that. But being aware of that having compassion, empathy, and, and having um, students speak out about how they feel. I know that's very hard to be vulnerable, but that's, that's. I mean, your generation is going to do it. We we couldn't crack that because the, there's the silent majority, just like you had said, Darren, and you're, and you're absolutely right. Um, so I'm not going to say any of my other comments because it's in light of what it was said. I just wanted to uplift, lift up all of our students um, yeah. for your voices because that's super important. And, and, and thank you for letting me share. Yeah, thank you. And the tireless work of our educators. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have anything else? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for um, the students and all that you shared with us. And Darren, I really admire you for speaking so passionately and openly and vulnerable, being vulnerable about your experience. I had no idea that it was that pervasive that people were experiencing that kind of language every single day. It's, and I agree with you too, that, um, you know, we've done so much training, we've done so much education. How do we change the culture? And I feel like, I don't know, I don't know how you go about this, but teenagers really care about what their peers think. And if it's like, that kind of language is getting positive reinforcement. It must, you know, how do we flip that? How do we flip it so that that's kind of like the not cool thing to say instead of the cool thing to say? Um, that's, yeah. you know, we need some like, <laughs> yeah, you y'all need to be influencers for that. Influencers. Yeah, I don't know, but that's just the thought that I had. And then, um, Another thing that a couple of things I was thinking about as we were, as I was going through the survey results and as we were talking tonight, um, so much of the survey questions dealt with race and racism. And even in our language, when we use the word diversity, it's, it's almost like a, a, a proxy for just ethnicity. And there's so much more to diversity than just race and ethnicity. Um, it's kind of reductive if we only think of it in those terms. And one thing that I would be interested to know is what is the culture or what is the climate of viewpoint diversity and freedom of expression um, in class and on campus? And how, let me give you a couple of um examples. So at Hillsdale, they're having a, the senior class is having a democracy day project. You, okay. You, you're nodding your head. So my understanding is that they are, the senior class is in charge of teaching the rest of the student body about democracy and coming up with lesson plans. Um, so my daughter's group, I don't know whose idea it was, but, or somebody had a contact with Nikki Haley's office. And it was put forward, how about we invite Nikki Haley to be a speaker at Democracy Day? And all the students in the discussion kind of were like, side eye, like, mm, I don't think so. Like, I don't think that's going to go over well. And it, to me, it was like, well, why not? She's She's the only female candidate that, and she's mixed race, like she is diverse, but maybe she's 
diverse in the wrong way. So that's something that we need to be aware of on our campuses, that students need to feel safe in knowing that uh, people who have different political leanings or different um, worldviews can also express themselves and feel safe in, and inclusive, that those types of viewpoints can be expressed. Um, to the teacher's credit, he said something like, well, I know that this is a very, you know, left blue, left leaning political area, but we need to show our student body that we are diverse in this way. So nevertheless, Nikki Haley ghosted them, but it was a good try. <laughs> <laughs> she won't be coming for diversity. And just, if I can interrupt really democracy. quickly, we, we do ask questions about uh, religious intolerance in the in the survey. So you, we can, our staff have that data. Um, we didn't highlight that in this particular presentation because we're really focusing on in the LCAP on these particular issues of hate speech. Mm -hmm. But in the survey, we have lots of, so there's there's a whole other chunk of the survey, which we didn't talk about tonight, oh. um, that has to do with student social emotional well-being. Like there's a lot of other data we get from the survey. Mm. Your point about freedom of expression is an interesting one. We'll, we're will we we're starting a new LCAP. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for us to think about new questions. We know we need to do some re redesign of the questions. It's plausible we could think about something around that idea of, you know, how 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 freely do you do you feel able to speak. I can't speak. I can't think of the I, question. I might right now. be able to articulate some language sure, for you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, as we a, try to be as inclusive and thoughtful about all of the different kinds of differences that we have. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that you had something wanted to say, right? And then I think I'm going to, we're going to move on with the item because I, I think we're, <laughs> they got to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you yeah. students. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. They got to school tomorrow. They got to go. Thank you. Yeah. It's the last day before the break. That's right. Nice. So I, I you know, I want to thank the students. I know they're they're leaving, and I want to thank our student board reps and and the honesty and fidelity with which experiences were shared. Um, I don't think any of us as educators are blind or deaf to any of this. Um, one of the things the board has asked over the last two years is that I bring forward uh, issues opportunities where we celebrate like we did at the earlier part of our meeting with the proclamations, but also opportunities to have conversations about where we're falling short and they're not fun. Uh, they're, they hurt. Like I, I feel hurt, right? I think we all do in here. We feel hopeful with, with the remarks from, from our students and where we want to go, but we're also hurting by the experiences that our students and I would say our educators uh, especially our educators as well, uh, suffer from. So I'm appreciative about the grassroots efforts because I think that's really what's going to turn the tide. It's not a proclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the superintendent's words, but it's it's really the grassroots efforts of our educators and our students and our families. Uh, and I would go so far as to say that, you know, over the last year and so many months that I've been here, I've seen students and educators protest, protest things that are going on in the world. Uh, and I would encourage our students and educators to take to heart that motto of, you know, think globally, but act locally. And what are some of the things that our students and our educators, myself included, can change and affect here on our campuses in the now? Um, I would like us to consider discussing and developing rather what we don't want. What do we expect to speak in the positive? What do we expect in how we treat each other? What do we expect in how we speak to each other? What do we expect in what humanizing language looks like? We focus a lot on what and defining what dehumanizing language is. I think we need to put as much effort into defining and expressing and developing a commitment um, around what humanizing language is. What does it mean to be respectful and loving and encouraging? And I ask that we all hold or share a commitment to disrupt the kinds of things that walk away from these expectations of what it means to be humans to one another. Uh, I was on campuses the last couple of weeks and 
you know, I saw it and heard it as well. And I hold myself to a commitment to disrupt. I disrupted it every time. Now it's easy for me because I have comma superintendent after my last name. So I hold the position of power. I get it. Um, but I'm going to ask everyone in our educational community to join me in that commitment to disrupt. I'll be meeting with uh, principals when we get back from the break to talk more extensively about a reset around pulling people together to discuss and define what do we expect in humanizing language. Uh, I think it's oftentimes a lot easier to latch on to uh, goodness, uh, graciousness, forgiveness, um, and love than it is oftentimes about punishment and discipline. And I agree on the flip side with what Dr. Kemke said, there needs to be consequences as well. Um, but let's start with what we expect. Let's hold to a commitment to disrupt dehumanizing language. Uh, let's support the grassroots efforts um, and, and tackle this as a community. And, and the last thing I'll say is what you'll see on our agenda for future board agenda items, uh, Dr. Black and I are gonna bring back racial equity policies and this discussion for April, before any of this came up, we were set to bring this forward on April 25th's board meeting for a further discussion. So this was like part one tonight. And then uh, we'll do a lot more part two on April 25th because we're committed to this work. So I, I want to thank you. I know it's been a long night and I'm going to hand it back over to, to President Zuniga. Thank you. Um, now it is 916. Um, how is everybody feeling? Do you need a break? Bio break, anything? Or you guys want to keep going? Ish okay. Um, maybe Great. maybe we could do, um, instead of roll call votes, we could just do the, the group. Yeah, that one. Okay, sure. Is that what? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we'll do a, uh, what is it, unanimous? Yep. Um, okay. Um, going on to construction, item Q. Um, go ahead, Mr. Hawkins. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think uh, Mark Katroki um, from QKA, I believe, is is going to pop up. I'll give him a second. Um, uh, until then, uh, on December seventeenth, twenty twenty, the Board of Trustees approved uh, the Measure L uh, project list. Included on that, um, in the the second half of the bond, was the classroom refresh transformation project. Um, and then on January 9th of this year, uh, the district issued its RFQ, a request for qualifications uh, for the uh, for architectural services for this project. Um, and then on February 8th, 2024, uh, the board authorized uh, 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 the superintendent to enter into contract and negotiations uh, for this project. Um, just to uh, remind the public, I, I know the, bo the board knows um, QKA and the district have partnered um, very, very successfully uh, over the past 20 years. Um, some of the, the highlights of those projects include um, the San Mateo Performing Arts Center next door, uh, the Mills Gym and Theater, um, the new Burlingame Gym that has just started uh, construction, and last but not least, the building that we're sitting in right now, um, the district office building um, uh, that we're in. Uh, so uh, with that, um, Dr. Quintana is here with me tonight, um, and Mark Katroki, the Q in QKA. Um, if there are any questions for the board, um, I'm happy, or the team likely is happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, um, let's see, this is not, no. yes, yep. but do we have any comments from the public? There are none. Great, okay. Um, can I, I make a motion, motion to award the architectural service grant Thank to you. you? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Trustee Land and a second by Trustee Griffin. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, motion passes. All right, um, going to the next item. Uh, I believe that's yes. Division of Human Services. Oh, resource. Yeah, just one for you today. <laughs> um, thank you. 
Yes, uh, we have the consent agenda of personal actions and adult uh, adult school transfers. Great. Um, let me see. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Uh, just if you're, you know, just say whatever you need to say. Um, okay. Um, can I have, get a motion? Oh, no, the next one. Sorry, sorry. No, you're good. There's... Do they consent? You still have to yeah. approve the consent. So yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the consent, personal consent. Today. Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, motion by Trustee Land, second by Trustee Chavez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I'm going on to Division of Human Services, personal actions. Yeah, point, pers no. sorry, point of order. So if you're going to do consent, it's always good to do all those in favor. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carried 5 zero. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. No, no of course. Uh, so for the first item, it's personal actions addendum. And we have one recognition. Janice Harui, our student data analyst at Cappuccino High School, has submitted her retirement effective on July 12th, and she's been with the district for 27 years and three months. Okay, thank you. Um, any discussion? No, anything from the public? There's none. Okay, um, I'd like to get a motion to approve. Do we approve the addendum? We approve yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Make a motion to approve the addendum. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, motion by Trustee Land. Second by Trustee Chavez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any oppositions? Extensions? Nothing. Motion carries. Um, next item is approval of induction accreditation. Yes. Uh, approval of induction accreditation a coordinator job description. Uh, it, next year will be our fourth year for our teacher induction program already. And that means that we're going to have our first accreditation review. Uh, and then if we pass that, it'll be seven years to the next one. But it's a lot of work, very similar to the WASC. And this would be also similar to the WASC, a, a point two release period for a teacher to help with uh, the preparation of the accreditation materials just for one year. Make okay. a motion for the job description. Um, there doesn't need a motion. No. No. To approval. Just keep going. No, no, this is... Um... Sorry, we've got the script wrong. And this is an action item. Okay, I apologize. Thank you. It's on me. Sorry, it has to be in that's, approval. That's so I'm making a motion ahead. to approve the, the, the job you. description. Okay. So a motion by Trustee Land, second by Trustee Chavez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, no abstentions and no opposition. So motion passes. Um, item three, approval of student records. The student records trans, uh, trans, transition coordinator job description. Uh, we haven't had this previously. We've used our transportation people to move records from middle schools to the high schools. Uh, we'd like to solidify that process with a, a position um, for a $3,000 stipend. Great. Okay. Um, I any... make a motion for approval Thank of you. the job description. Well, I need to oh, see if sorry. the public has any yep. questions or anything. There's none. Sorry, I Thank jumped you. the gun. I'll make the motion now. <laughs> Thank I'll, you. I'll second. Okay. Motion by Trustee Land and second by uh, Trustee Griffin. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 And there's no, you guys have to say aye too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, and no abstentions and no opposition. So motion carries. I have a question. Yes. It's just an informational question. Are we literally taking boxes of student records and hauling them around? Yeah. yeah. Cumulative records. I can, uh, I give three, four boxes to them. <laughs> and, and so then we enter them in our record system. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and some are required to be kept for years. Yeah. And during, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it's eternity, but close. Six, seven, eight years. <laughs> yep. Well, that's hard to believe in the information age and with all the technology yeah. and all the stuff that's. <laughs> a lot of it's medical records and okay. backgrounds. They're files, right? Yeah. They're just file. like cumulative mm -hmm. files. Okay. Yeah. Just just wanted to check. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Going on to uh, Division of Student Services. None this evening. Thank you. Uh, how about Division of Instructional Services? None this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, going on to Division of Business Services. Mr. Hawkins. Uh, tonight we bring for, forward for uh, consideration the Fifth Amendment uh, to the Purchase and Sale Agreement uh, for Crestmore with Summerhill Homes. Uh, this uh, amendment uh, finalizes uh, the date of sale and adds a 
$2 million deposit from Summerhill uh, that will be attributed to the total uh, purchase price. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions or comments from the board uh, with respect to the Fifth Amendment to purchase a sale and sale agreement and joint escrow instructions for the sale of Crestmore School Site to Summerhill Homes, LLC? I'll, I'll make the motion to approve the Fifth Amendment. I'll Not second quite. it. Not quite yet, because I need to take questions and comments. I think from the public. we 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 make the motion, second it, and then we have a discussion. I think. no, she's asking for public oh, comment. Oh, public comment. Yeah. Um, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, there are no. none. I none. That. Okay. Um, okay. So now I can entertain a motion. So motion by Trustee Chavez. Yeah. Second. Second by Trustee Land. And the only question I have is: this is going to get us one step further closer to where we want to be, which is this final sale. Correct. That's all I wanted to hear. Okay. okay, I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little slower because Ari is still interpreter. Oh, sorry. To interpret. <laughs> Thank you. And it's also okay. important to note that when we have amendments, there's usually a deposit that's associated along with having another amendment. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. There are no abstentions and no opposition, so the motion carries. Um, let me go on. Thank you. Board operations. Okay, board operations. A review and discuss board policy. Dr. Black. Uh, thank you, Dr. Black uh, and trustees. Uh, this is an update to uh, our board policy. Um, the board policy for travel and reimbursement uh, has uh, two allowable, uh, the CSBA policy has two allowable um, actual expenditures and the IRS uh, per diem rate um, in order to uh, support our staff and uh, quicken the reimbursement process um, and uh, and uh, address some feedback that we've received from staff members. Um, uh, the business office um, in conjunction and uh, with support from uh, the curriculum and special education uh, department are making the recommendation uh, to change um, to the per diem uh, recommendation that is uh, in compliance uh, with IRS regulations starting in July of 2024. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, with that. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. You know, my uh, my inclination would be uh, the IRS has a per diem, but I think the GSA has a per diem by state, by locale, it would probably be more appropriate because sometimes you're in high cost areas. And if if you look at that, I think that's a fair way to treat the uh, the employees. Yeah, that, that, that's actually what, what we were looking at, um, the GSA rates in compliance with the IRS regulations. So uh, yeah, we're, we travel in any of the two highest, yeah. um, uh, you know, whether California really, you know, 98% of California is within, uh, that we would travel is within those two highest rates. So we agree, uh, that it gets, um, uh, that, yeah, we would use those rates. Yeah, uh, I travel in those same areas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's my question. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Are there any questions from the public? There are none. Great. Okay. And this needs, this is going to consent, right? Next. Okay. Thank Correct. you. All right. Um, we will, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to future board agenda items. Go ahead, Mr. Booker. Yeah. So we have several kind of on the, on the, the docket or in the bullpen here, uh, bringing in academic counselors, the board asked for a gateway update, uh, instructional leadership update. Um, and we'll continue to talk about that. We're going to have National Jewish American Heritage Month proclamation on April 25th. Uh, our Sustainability and San Mateo County Youth Commission uh, will likely be April 25th. Uh, and a racial equity update April 25th. we got a lot going on on April 25th. Um, uh, so yeah, exciting stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, are I there... Yeah. Is now when we make our request. Yes, go ahead. Okay. I would like to ha um, request maybe a presentation or evaluation of our CTE pathways programs um, 
graduation requirements, what our current thinking is about all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are okay. there any other? Uh, can I have a request? So we have usually in the past, what we used to do is on the future board agenda items, the ones that we have not finished, we put so that we can remind ourselves what it is. You mean list them on the agenda yep. itself? Yep. You can do that. Okay. That'd be easier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is it is in the yeah. board planning document. Right. I know. Yeah. But I, I know. Okay. And I'm weak at that. This is when I really remember. Okay. So yeah, happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, to, to Trustee Land's point, sometimes I bring up the environmental discussion of the student that wanted to have uh, a discussion about composting utensils and whatnot at the school sites. And I know that sometimes things are not, it might be in the planning document, like that, I said, but just yeah, it, that one's on April 20th. Yeah, he mentioned oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments from the public? There are none. Great. Okay. And I think that concludes. Um, I will move to adjourn. Thank you. All right.